I saw live, come on, yeah. It just takes a little while, but sometimes there's hook, uh, hookups on these things. But YouTube's actually quicker to go on live than Facebook the last couple of times. Huh. I agree. Thank you for joining us today here at Two Feathers on our virtual series of Indigenous speakers. My name is Teresina Obi. I am a Yurok tribal member and serve as a cultural coordinator and prevention specialist at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. Mm -hmm. It is an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Eduardo Duran. Dr. Duran is a clinical psychologist and U.S. Navy veteran. He is one of the first to write and bring attention to soul wounding, historical trauma, and the spirit of alcohol. He is the author of Native American Postcolonial Psychology, Transforming the Soul Wound, Healing the Soul Wound, and Buddha in Red Face, to name a few. Dr. Duran's foundation of clinical research and practice provides invaluable therapeutic healing and balanced methodologies. His ability to integrate Western and cultural responsive strategies is one of the foundations that we use in working within tribal communities today. As I mentioned, it is an honor and privilege to be here today. Dr. Duran, I am excited to hear about your legacy, your work, and your contributions uh, across this nation. So thank you. And thank you. And you say you're Yurok, and I'm actually wearing uh, one of your uh, tribal members' uh, bracelets here. This is a David Ipina. Ah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I actually knew him back in the day, and I know he's not here anymore, but uh, it's timely that I'm wearing the, the bracelet he made for me. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Did you know him or? No, but I definitely heard of the name. So it's thank you for the representation. Yeah, he, he used to say, uh, when they asked him, well, what tribe are you from? He says, well, he says that you are okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get that. I said, well, that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just a little side. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the YouTube channel. Thank you for bearing with us on this um, tricky day. Happy Friday while yeah. I'm here. And um, yeah, so I guess we're going to hop right into it. But first, you know, I just want to personally check in with you, Dr. Duran. How are you handling you know, COVID-19 and how is this impacting you and your community? Uh, well, it's by having to stay home, you know, and uh, and I'm fortunate that I can I can still work because uh, most of the patients I was seeing still want to be seen in, in this kind of way, and so I've been uh, pretty busy. Uh, but it's been uh, unfortunately Montana, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of wild west psychology here where uh, people aren't following the rules. And, and so we, we have quite a few cases right here in Bozeman and, uh, and, and it's totally unnecessary because there's not that many people here, but people just haven't been uh, adhering to, you know, to what the CDC and, and all that. And so it's a little bit worrisome to go out there because we do have quite a few cases. There's over 120 just here in, the, in this community. And I heard that there's that many like in Sacramento and they have like 10 times the amount of people. So yeah, it's a little bit stressful, but uh, so far, you know, uh, creators blessed us and we're okay and like that, so. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. It's unfortunate for everyone, you know, I think at these times, you know, people tend to react differently, you know, and it's hard to be compassionate or patient because, you know, lives are at risk and everything like that. So it's really challenging, but, you know, all we can do ourselves is just make sure we're safe and take care of our loved ones and hopefully we pray that those folks kind of come to the conclusion sooner than later yeah. um so yeah maybe explain a little bit about like who you are and what you do for those who may not know you i think most of our audience could be community members you know and some some i'm sure are here as fans of your work in the western academia but i would love to hear kind of like from your own words on like what you do and why you do it i guess mm -hmm. would be a good start well, uh, what I do, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, but uh, most of the work that I've been doing for a long time, over 30 years or whatnot, 
has been in the area of trying to uh, to integrate, you know, indigenous thought and theory uh, into kind of the, the clinical paradigm. And, uh, and so uh, that, that's been the question. For most of the time, I work either for tribal programs or IHS or urban. And, uh, you know, recently in the last five years or so, I, I just went into private uh, because it's a lot more freedom uh, to, to do and to go and, and come and go without having somebody have to approve you and, and all that. <clears throat> and so, so it's been a really good shift and, uh, and also a lot less stressful because as you know, working in community, it's really hard and because you're on call all the time. And so uh, after being on call for like 25 years, I thought there's only so much tread on the tire, you know? Uh, and I, it, it can wear out, and so, uh, <clears throat> so the work uh, that I do now, and you know, and very, you know, some writing because I, I, I didn't want to do any more of that because, you know, there's people like you that can do it now, and, uh, but uh, yeah, just last year we did the second edition of Healing the Soul Wound, and and I added a chapter on veterans there because I am a veteran, and. Uh, and having worked with veterans, I felt that uh, there's got to be a new way <clears throat> that we can do that work. And so uh, that's kind of the, the, the new piece in it, but uh, still continuing to, to train uh, professionals uh, all over Indian country, because as you know, most native clinics uh, don't have native professionals working there. And so it's become kind of a quest to to at least let people know there's a different way of doing this. And, uh, and it's un unfortunately and surprisingly, there's still a lot of resistance by professionals and they still want to continue what I call, and you're aware of the colonizing therapies, colonizing methods, uh, which actually make the situation worse. <clears throat> and so that's been uh, also kind of trying to redefine how we diagnose has been part of the part of the work and and so that's uh, kind of what what I do in kind of in a nutshell right on thank you for that I think that helps get everyone kind of on the same page in some way um, when you mentioned that you kind of went away from like the public mental health into private that kind of reminds me of just like how like you said there's more freedom with it with that and I kind of just kind of goes back to the importance of, you know, bringing the community and bringing in a culture to make sure that is like a sense of healing because individual therapy isn't as, as effective as community therapy. So with the, I really appreciate that. And that kind of reminds me of Chris, who is part of our broadcast today, and he's a prevention specialist at Two Feathers. And I'd like to let him kind of take it in, get in on this conversation because I feel like he, he works pretty hands-on with a lot of um, adolescent teens. And so, oh, okay. go ahead. Yeah, uh, the kind of question I have is uh, the, we talked about resistance on people who are going into the field. And I know me personally, I'm someone who is uh, trying to get into a field of mental health or social work or something like that. How do we get, kind of how do you contrast between trying to get more Native people in the field with uh, working in that, like, uh, colonizing theory that you said? Like, how do you kind of get those, uh, mismatch those? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, and I, and I get uh, calls and emails from uh, Native students from all over, you know, and, and asking, well, where can we go and learn what you talk about and what you write about? And, and I, I tell them, well, there's no, no school or university that does this because this is way off the grid. And, and, and then my advice to, to them is, uh, get through that system uh, in, in a way that you don't come out on the other side uh, totally colonized and, and, and being that way. But that's really hard to do because once you go through like a master's PhD program and write all the papers and, and please all your professors, I mean, they wanna hear certain things. And if you keep saying them long enough, uh, you can become it. And, uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's a real difficult, process for you know native students native people to go through that system get the credentials i mean look what's happening to uh brother virgil you know he did everything right you know he he did all these years of schooling and he wrote all the papers and 
and and still at the end, I mean, I, I couldn't hardly believe the story, you know, and and so uh, I I tell uh, my mantra to to these students that I talk to is uh, you're gonna have to think guerrilla warfare to where you just go underground and uh, you know and you can pretend and and still keep in contact with who you are with community with elders with traditional people that can keep helping you go to ceremonies do prayers every day and continue to restore your identity. So when you come out with a degree and the license, then you, you haven't forgotten who you are. And so that's, that's but that's a tough, uh, something difficult to ask of people to do because it's, they re, you know, the system will reward you for not being who you are. You know, they'll give you the big job, the big professorship and all that. And, and so, uh, it's really hard to make it through that way, but it, it is doable. And then I always tell people like yourselves that whatever you write, publish it. Because then in, in the white world, if, uh, if it's written and published, it becomes true. But if it's not written and published, and it's not, it's just some Indian guy saying stuff. And, and that's been the reason why I, I put out this stuff, <clears throat> because then it becomes part of the, the training program. And so at least students can then say, wow, you know, it's, there's something there that I can cite and I can use that actually speaks to me. And so that's been a part of the, uh, the idea of, of writing this stuff. And I, and I encourage yourself and everybody that's here to, to continue doing that because that's how we're gonna really change the system is by making our stuff part of the, the paradigm that's actually taking over because the old, uh, the Western paradigm is just not working. And, uh, you know, look at what's happening in our world. Uh, if it was working, uh, you know, the world would be a different place. And so that's kind of uh, how I see it. I don't know if that covers the question, I hope. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're a San Francisco Giants fan, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I grew up... Uh, Worshiping uh, Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, uh, man, those those are the people that got me through high school. Just listening on the radio, uh, you know, number twenty four, number forty four, right after, you know, knocking it out of the park. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. <laughs> I have to talk more about that afterwards. I like it. <laughs> yeah, from one Giants fan to another, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I like how you mentioned that. Like you know, you it's it's, you, it's important to remember like who you are as an indigenous person, as a native person while going into this Western education. You know, I think that's something I was grateful to have that kind of guidance growing up, just knowing that, you know, it's important to be, you know, community based and part of your culture in that way. But, you know, it's just as important to get that education so then you can be validated and for lack of a better term, validated in the Western sense. So it does make a difference, just even if it does just look like a citation at the end of the sentence or end of the paper, I think it just, it just, it's stamped into the Western academia, which is timely, you know, there's that, that's going to be there for generations to come, just as long as the society continues to exist. And, you know, these pandemics just definitely exemplify just how important it is to to still be community based, you know, I think it's easy to go one way or the other, but just having that balance, just like anything is very important. And it actually reminds me of Virgil and how he has accomplished what he has done and getting his degrees and it's inspiring. So Virgil, did you want to talk a little bit about what you have, like what the unique things that you have going on here at Two Feather? Well, I, I, well, I was wondering about, you know, I think some people that are tuning in right now are, are clinicians, people working in substance abuse and behavioral health, uh, the behavioral health field. And so, uh, Dr. Duran, I'm wondering, uh, when you say that uh, psychotherapy can be uh, or is often colonizing, uh, what do you mean by that? And then, uh, you know, I think, uh, what are the ways that we can do talk therapy uh, differently if it, or just talk? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a two part question. Like, what do we mean when we say, you know, psychotherapy as is, is a, is a form of coloni colonization. 
And then what are the alternative ways if we're going to engage in talk therapy to not colonize? Well, uh, I think it starts right at the beginning of, uh, of, of just the language, you know, because uh, in, in the English language, uh, everything is objectified because nouns carry the, carry the meaning. And, and because of that uh, uh, objectifying process, what we do is, is we separate ourselves from the world, which uh, is completely contrary to, uh, to how most indigenous uh, cultures operate in, to where in the languages of most indigenous people, it's a, it's a moving language, it's verbs that carry the meaning. So <clears throat> in psychotherapy, the very act of uh, ma making a diagnosis, right, where you tell the patient or whatever the group, well, you are a uh, major depressive disorder. Well, that's a real separation that happens there. They're there and you're over here and now they're objectified and in a way that becomes a naming ceremony that that's who they are. And, uh, <clears throat> and so it's been my uh, understanding by, you know, talking and doing lots of this work in, uh, in communities uh, and, and kind of changing, shape-shifting that metaphor and, and not telling people who they are. Uh, and, 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 but still using the English language, trying to, to make it a language of movement. Uh, because I, I was up in the Yukon a couple of years ago and this young man who was studying linguistics, and they told me that uh, basically what, what nouns are are static verbs. So something has, has stopped within, and as you know, language predisposes how we perceive the world. <clears throat> so going back to the diagnosis, instead of telling somebody you are an alcoholic or you are a diabetic or you are whatever, I always preface it by saying maybe the spirit of sadness is visiting you or maybe the spirit of diabetes is visiting you, which is a real different message than you are uh, X, you know, you're a diabetic or you're whatever. And it, because it, it forms an identity when, when we do that. And then people know what a depressed person is supposed to do and act like. And so if they internalize that diagnosis, then they start acting like that. And it becomes really difficult for them to, to then undo or transform that into something else. Because again, the, the treatment or the, the healing uh, <clears throat> in the Western medical model is to get rid of stuff. It's that you, you try to cut it out or you medicate it or you do something, but the natural law is, says you can't do that. You know, you cannot create or destroy energy or matter. So <clears throat> with the people I work with, I say, well, well maybe the task here is, is to shape shift it and transform it into something good for you. So we can take the spirit of sadness and <clears throat> through ceremonializing the therapy and the spirit of sadness can reveal itself to you as to what it really is trying to show you. And then it'll give you insight and knowledge so you can do something with, something with it in your life. So it becomes really interesting then to people, to patients, because it's like, whoa, I can do that. Or you know, spirit of diabetes, or spirit of PTSD, or what have you, to engage with it and make a relative, versus trying to get rid of it because it's not possible to get rid of anything. And so that's kind of my my take on that. And and so far, people, not just Native people, white folks, really appreciate that too. Yeah, that makes sense. And and one of the things, part of kind of what you said, but. Uh, what I was, you know, doing a little follow-up research uh, and uh, just on some of your work. Uh, and one of the things you said is that that you see psychotherapy as possibly the ceremony towards spiritual ceremonies. Uh, and so, like maybe psychotherapy or somebody coming in that that's what that's where they're at and that's what they're due. Mm -hmm. And that and what I took from it. Uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm throwing it out as a question, is that it's the uh, ceremony to go possibly for some people to the spiritual ceremony. Did, did I get that right? And, and if so, could you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, because I, I think that was a question recently that somebody uh, asked, 
And, but the way they were asking the question is like uh, psychotherapy and ceremony are separate. And, and there it is again because of the, of the world we live in, in the Western world, everything is separate. And, and my understanding is that it's a continuum and psychotherapy is a ceremony if you as the healer want it to be that. And so, but if the patient needs it to be just psychotherapy in the beginning, well, that's okay, you know, they need to be where they're at. But then through their dreams and through working with them, uh, they start doing ceremonial activities in their life to connect them back to the sacred. And so then all of this, because psychotherapy, I mean, it's literally, it's from the Greek translation means soul healing. And so in the very roots of the Western system are, are these traditional understandings, you know, soul healing is a pretty big deal. That's a spiritual activity, but most psychotherapists don't know that, you know, but if you're a psychotherapist, literally that means you're a soul healer. Well, then that's a whole different gig than, than what most psychotherapists think it is. And it's really amazing to me that uh, people aren't, aren't taught that, but, uh, yeah, so that's kind of how, how I see it. And, and, uh, and then ceremonializing, uh, you, you know, the office, ceremonializing the day, it becomes really important to where then, then the, you know, the, the, the patient doesn't have to depend on you forever because then they can go and start doing their own ceremony, whatever that is, whether it's in Christianity or traditional way or both, then they have more meaning in their life. And, and once you have meaning, you know, existentially, you can still have the suffering because a, a lot of people are going to suffer their whole life. Then the suffering isn't wasted. And, and, and then the suffering can also be part of their ceremony. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. I think that that's kind of, it's interesting on how ironic or there's like a lot of um, discrepancies as far as how historically like colonization kind of took that, that strength of indigenous people and like intentionally knowing that they had a greater connection. And, and it's very much like today that looks like very much like a uh, reactive type of management, even in the health, health side of things. And, you know, but traditionally I feel like indigenous people were so in tune that there's a lot of proactive work and ongoing work. And it reminds me a lot of what Teresina Obi does a lot, does well in and is her cultural background and how much of that leadership kind of transfers into like the youth who kind of look to her and find her as a form of guidance. And that's what we're trying to do is trying to mold together, you know, the Western science that like Western problem kind of needs a Western solution, but also kind of for that sustainability it needs that indigenous perspective too. And I think Teresina was about to start to speak to that. So please. Thank you. Yeah, for me, you know, it's about living, we call it balancing in both worlds, right? But for many people, it's one world and how we infuse and integrate our cultural ceremonies and our uh, cultural knowledge into the Western ide ideations because, you know, how can you have one without the other and creating an unbalanced human form? Mm -hmm. So, um, Dr. Duran, can you explain a little bit more about how, how does a clinician um, and or a client decipher between a mental health disparity versus a malnourished brain or traumatic brain injury because of historical trauma and grief? You know, we have generations that are, in other words, un can be unbalanced. And how do we bring that back into balance through ceremony, language, culture? <clears throat> I should have asked uh, Dr. Virgil there that I was only going to take easy questions. Oh. <laughs> That's a hard question, <laughs> but uh, no. But it's a profound question to it, and, and it's really the the task. And uh, and my you know, and in working with trauma, uh, in of course historical trauma that that gets passed on, and, and you know all, all about that, but what happens at the moment of trauma also is that there's that in uh that shooting of uh the perpetrator's energy into the victim or the whether it's individual or collectively like to a whole community where the perpetrator can you know just shoot that energy in, into people 
And when that enters, sometimes it becomes so, so uh, painful that a, a part of our soul just leaves. And of course, even in Western psychology, they have terms for that, like depersonalization, decompensation. And when we talk to like veterans or victims of abuse, they report that they see themselves outside their body and, uh, and as things are happening to them. And like with uh, the veterans and the veteran suicide, where a lot of them have never, their bodies came home, but their soul is still over there somewhere in Afghanistan. So then the act of suicide becomes very easy because there's nobody there to kill. They're already left their soul over there. <clears throat> so then the task becomes through, through therapy, through healing, uh, you know, where there is this combination of Western and traditional, which usually has to be because, you know, people, most people are colonized and they expect some of the Western also which there's good stuff in the Western. And, but by talking and changing the metaphor of how we diagnose and how we approach people, what happens, uh, I call that the two for one approach because then we're doing the intervention, whether it's through ceremony uh, or another means, but then by talking that way and, and saying, well, maybe the spirit of sadness is visiting you, maybe this is happening what we're doing is validating the culture to where the person says, wow, uh, the way my grandmother talked is really a good way. It's not what they told me it was. And so now you're doing the intervention, but you're also bringing back a, a part of their soul that has been out there somewhere for generations. And, and so it's, you know, the, the new agers call it soul retrieval. But it really is that to where restoring the soul of the individual and also of the community by, by shifting the intervention to, to native metaphor and talking in a different way. And we can still use Western interventions, but we can say them Indian way to where now the elder or the person who's grown up traditionally said, well, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Well, if you say it the other way, it's like they, they look at you, well, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then we, we, we label them as resisting and they don't want to get well and all that. When in reality, it's the intervention isn't making any more sense. And so their soul continues to fly out there outside their body. And, and then through dreams and so on also to restore that. And, and, and so I think that that is the task. And if we restore the souls of enough individuals and uh, the soul of the community also is restored. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, that's why I know that in, in your community, you know, ceremonies are, are happening because I've been to them and, and, it, it, and it's a slow process, but I tell people, you know, if it took uh, 550 years to get to where we are now, and let's say it only takes 50 to fix this, to heal it, well, that's a pretty good deal, you know, but I'd rather have it all done today. But so far, Creator hasn't put me in charge. And if Creator ever puts me in charge, I'll, I'll fix it right away. But so far, I haven't been asked. <laughs> so, yeah. Does that make sense, what I said? I mean, uh, yes, it does. You know, especially when you talk about um, changing the dialogue versus, you know, our traditional way of thinking versus westernized and how to infuse them together. You know, there's just different ways of explaining. So as, um, can you elaborate more on specific healing strategies for our tribal communities that help prevent or will break the cycle of abuse, especially for when we're talking about indigenous knowing or indigenous knowledge, how can we translate that to specific methodologies or practices in changing that cycle? You mean like uh, violence and stuff like that? Yes. That kind of a, well, you asked two really hard questions. <laughs> hey, how come the guys ask easy questions in your <laughs> <laughs> um, And, and uh, again, you know, this is something that, um, uh, Talking to, to people, I, I say, you know, there's the, the individual that did this, but there's also the energy that took a hold of the individual to do that. 
And so to just blame the individual, okay, that can help a little bit and we do all the legal stuff and all that, but that doesn't really heal the whole thing. What we need to do is we need to trace the energy back to whoever brought it here in the first place. And uh, that's why when I go into communities, uh, I ask, I say, well, who, who brought this here? Who, there's a name, you gotta find out who did it. And in every community, and now with people in their iPhones and so on, they just get online and, and they find out right away who did it. And there was actually individuals that did that. And, you know, for, for example, uh, like when I was talking to a group of uh, native people somewhere in, in, in the plains and it was diabetes, you know, the high incidence of that. And of course, 110 years ago, there was almost zero diabetes in Indian country. And so I, I asked, well, who brought the energy here? The spirit of diabetes, somebody brought it here. And so when we trace it back, uh, we, you know, we find that uh, it was General Sherman and some of his people uh, that when they were given the task of uh, eradicating what they call the Indian problem, his, his solution was just go kill everybody because that's the kind of general he was. But they say, well, you can't do that because it's become very unpopular and there's some people that are getting squeamish about that. So what he said then is, well, let's destroy their commissary, which is military jargon for let's destroy their food supply. So and then I told folks, so what he did is he, he put a sorcery of negative energy, of violent energy into the food. So a lot of times then when we eat that food that he kind of, did this to, then the food turns into our body and, and it creates a violence in our bodies. And then, you know, we lose body parts and all that. And so it's a matter of tracing it to the source. And, uh, and it could be even within a family system, you know, because a lot of times the abuse, the domestic violence happens. And uh, I ask really basic and what people would consider stupid questions like, uh, if I'm working with somebody who's a victim or I say, well, where did you learn to do that? I mean, where, where, where did whoever did this learn how to do that? And that's something that a lot of people have never, well, it's probably their mom or their dad. And then uh, I remember working with this woman and, uh, you know, a lot of violence in her life. And I kept asking the question, well, where did your mother and father learn? And she said, well, they're, parents were also violent and they drank and there was a lot of that. And so after about four generations up, I, I just asked her, has anyone in your family ever been to boarding school? And as soon as I asked that question, she knew exactly where it started. You know, her great, great grandma and great, great grandpa had been to Carlisle. And when we look at the history of what happened at Carlisle or any of the boarding schools, <clears throat> there was a profound amount of violence that has a spirit to it. And so that spirit of violence was, was shot into our great, great grandparents and it stayed in there and then they passed it on to their children. And so the spirit of violence has been doing this. And so when people start dealing with the actual spiritual component of it, then it, it liberates them from blaming so much, but then now it's time to actually heal the energy itself. And so if we can transform the spirit of violence into something good, then the energy becomes medicine. <clears throat> and so uh, in family systems, I, I always ask, well, where, where did this happen? Or with communities, like I was up in Canada some time ago, and of course they have a lot of terrible things through the boarding schools, that we call them residential schools. And I asked, there was like 200 people in the audience, and, uh, and I said, well, who brought this here? And I said, they, were, they didn't know. And so somebody real quickly went online and they got a name right away. It says it was a guy by the name of McDonald. And he actually went to the United States and studied with Captain Pratt as to how to kill the Indian, save the man. And so then he brought it to Canada. So now they had a historical lineage of where this violence came. And now we can address the violent, the spirit of violence itself Need, we need to make peace with that and heal the actual spirit. And then it'll, you know, then it'll transform and, and then the act of violence, it won't be possessing people to do that. And, but that's a real different way of looking at it because, you know, having worked in Indian clinics and all that, there's usually, 
you know, the pattern is, you know, you go to anger management and you do this and that, but a lot of times it is just doesn't work very well. Or it might stop just the behavior, but the person still has that energy and intention and, uh, and, and it still creates a lot of suffering within the family. And so it's tracing it to the source is, is, is the way that, uh, and, and now with, uh, like I said, everybody has an iPhone, uh, it's real easy to do. You can find out all kinds of stuff as to, like in your community, you, you could know exactly who, who it was that, that was the first person that came and did bad things. Mm -hmm. Once you have the name, then you can go and actually try to heal their family because obviously they were, they were suffering. And so the healing then becomes of, uh, of us, but also healing the perpetrator because, uh, like the 13 grandmothers uh they had a healing that happened here in montana and and they said we can't just heal ourselves we have to heal the soldiers also because if we only heal us that energy is still there and so we you know it becomes a real big act of compassion uh, a spiritual act that uh you know the creator's involved in that and, and so that's kind of one of the ways and but it's not easy because it's real easy to slide into uh, well you know i just want to hate that person because they're terrible they're evil uh well it's the energy you know mm -hmm. so thank you for that and you know when you talk about tracing the source that's a very unique and different way to think about it but also very intuitive to our own self-awareness and how we view these different types of energies or even putting a title or a name on it. So thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I could say a little bit more if, you, if it's okay with, I don't know how long you guys want to do this, but I was in this one community in Arizona where you know there was a lot of suicide and a lot of really hard violence. And uh, on the way, you know, they had people there from uh, experts, right, from like Harvard and Johns Hopkins and those places. And then there was me, and I'm not from any of those places. So I'm like, what am I doing here? But on the way up to into the community in the desert, uh, we stopped uh, at this place because they wanted to show me something. Uh, and so you know, up on the hill, there was, I said, well, what? There was this huge building, and, and that was the boarding school. And so I, I said, well, I kind of know in, in myself, I kind of said, well, I kind of know why the violence is here. But then I looked across the road and there was a little house, kind of a tourist type thing. And it had a fence around it and it was locked. And, and I asked them and I said, well, what's that little house over there? And they said, well, that's a house where General Crook lived. And I thought they were messing with me because you know, Indians like to tease, right? <laughs> I said, well, you guys are pretty funny, General Crook. And they said, no, really, that's his house. And I'm like, can I go see it? And of course, the gate was locked, so I had to jump over the fence and I looked in the window. And sure enough, man, his stuff was still there. His coffee mug, his glass that he looked through, and all the chair. And, uh, and, and that told me right away that uh, General Crook's spirit was still there killing Apache people. And so when I went over to the venue where, <clears throat> where the experts were, you know, there was a lot of Native people there, and I, and I talked about that. And they were just blown away. They were like, oh my gosh. Uh, just because his body's dead doesn't mean his intention is dead. And so then they had a whole new view as to how to approach the energy. And uh, there was a woman there that vowed, she says, I'm going to trace it back at least seven generations to see where it started, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to address it. And, uh, and so, you know, incidents like that have really convinced me that uh, this very old energy, because spirit doesn't, have, doesn't die, and just because our body dies, uh, if, you know, for good or bad or whatever, that intention stays. And General Crook uh, was still alive and well, even though his body's been gone for, and even his objects were still, and I couldn't believe they still had the stuff there. So not only, his body is buried there somewhere, but his objects that he used in doing what he was doing. So, so which general or colonel or whoever came into your area, you know, that would be a, a good task to find out. Mm -hmm. 
because they're there, they're still there. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if, if there's violence, then uh, they're still there because before they came, I, I can guarantee you, I don't know a lot about your tribe, but I can guarantee you that it, that it wasn't the way it is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of goes to be true, you know, I mean, I feel like just, like, yeah, just that the uh, fact that our last names kind of can be derivatives of who those people just might be. And so yeah. like, you know, that's an interesting way to kind of link it back. And also, you know, the land, I think the land is like an ongoing script for lack of better words to where you can see just the decim desecration of our lands and how that kind of shows, tells a story. If you see clear cut logging and now it's overgrown, it's just like, there's a lot of things going on here, especially if it's next to a ridge or, you know, a sacred site, it's just like, yeah, there's some intense things going on. And, you know, and so that's why I think as place-based peoples, it's important to be aware of the history. So then you could kind of, you could grasp that just enough to where maybe you can start thinking of some tangible skills that will kind of heal that wound. And, and I think that's what I like about your work is just kind of how much, how holistic it, you kind of bring everything into perspective. Because I know for myself, it was just a lot of like, man, this, why am I cursed? Like, why is this like just following me all the time? Like, this doesn't make sense, you know? And until like I went to college and, you know, Native American studies, and that was like the first thing is boarding schools. I'm like, both my grandmas went to that, you know? And so it's just like, damn, like, no wonder my parents are this way. And no wonder they teach me this way because they're just like, a product of forced assimilation and a product of just unhealthy habits that were just beaten into them. And so it's just like, now that I have that great understanding, I'm able to channelize that into where I, when I have a kid, it's just going to be like, there's no way that I'm going to allow that to cycle to continue. So it's very important for personal and then community growth to understand that history. And so that's what I like about your work is it it gives me a citation to where it's not just my personal experience where uh, I call BS you know that's too you're you're exaggerating it's like well you know there's literature out there there's not a lot but you know I'm going to be one of them citations one of these days and so it's really inspiring and I think that's something that Two Feathers does really good about is they're intentional with who they bring to the team because we have our own strengths and we have our own identity to embrace rather than just clinical side of it like it's a balance it's a team effort it's a community effort and I know Chris has been on the team for a long time and I'm sure he can relate in a lot of different ways so I'll go ahead and throw it over to him and see what he has to say well I gotta I gotta ask you a good question because apparently you said my first one was too easy so I gotta find a really good question but um you were talking I was really like mesmerized when we were talking about uh tracing the source and that kind of brings the uh the problem away from the person and i know there's like a lot of uh especially in native country there's a lot of uh people trying to find their identity mm -hmm. and they have this kind of westernized identity this uh other stuff that goes on to the fact that they don't even know who they are at certain points so uh i kind of want you to ask you can elaborate on just the uh, whole identity thing and how uh kind of tracing the source and getting that the spirit of stuff away from the identity of who they actually are can uh, like help people heal. Well, yeah, and uh, but also even before that, uh, going back to what uh, Charlie has said, um, <clears throat> the earth also uh, remembers because we are the earth. So when things happen to human beings who are the earth, it also happens to the earth. So part of the healing that needs to happen is, is that we also need to go and, uh, and make offerings and pray for the earth herself because she's the one who gives the water, gives the food, gives all of that into where we can start to re-sacramentalize uh, the earth, our, our mother. And, and uh, yeah, the identity to where, again, that was the purpose of the boarding schools because over the years I've you know, worked with a lot, of, especially urban natives who who they know they but they have no idea that the connection has been lost and uh and when i was working over at the oakland clinic uh, we used to bring in traditional healers into the office and uh, i remember this one uh, medicine person that we brought in uh, people would say that you know they would come in and uh, and they would say well i know i'm native but i have no idea who and uh, I, I don't even know how to find out and uh, he would have his altar right there in the office 
And after he would hear them say all that, he would say, well, uh, this one here pointing to the altar he says, knows exactly who you are. And it's always saying, welcome back, my great, great grandchild. Welcome back, my great, great granddaughter. And so it's a connection back to, to the altar and to the earth itself that restores the identity. And then uh, in working with people's dreams to where they start seeing their ancestors, they start seeing ceremony. And so again, spirit doesn't die and just because they forgot in the ego world who they are, well, their soul still knows exactly who they are. And, and the way to access that is through dreams is a really good way. And, and then there are people, you know, uh, traditional healers that can do that with their own power. You know, they, they have ways of moving into that realm and they can go and catch their soul and put it back in them. <clears throat> but uh, there's not too many uh, people like that left. And so then it becomes a process of uh, <clears throat> slowly restoring their soul. And, and it's been amazing uh, in, in my life to see people go from no identity to slowly but surely coming back home piece by piece to where then they can walk in the world as who they are and, uh, and then be intact and, and be able to help themselves and, and also community. And, and, but it's a, it's a process that you know, requires a commitment by, of course, the, per, the person that is seeking but also the people that are trying to help. And, and then of course the patience that goes with that. And, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful process to, to witness it because the dreams are so amazing because they sometimes it's like instantly, they, they just tell you, you know, they just tell you things. And, and so that's why in every community I go to, I say, you know, if you don't believe anything else, I say, start talking about your dreams because that is the original medicine. And I know that in a lot of the California tribes, because I worked in California quite a bit, I know that uh, the anthropologists had traced dream medicine like 10,000 years. And, and so that's the original way. And so if that's the original way, then why, why don't we use it? You know, because it's free. Everybody dreams every night. So I tell people, don't waste it, because creator's talking to you, but we need to pay attention and then learn, you know, how to decipher the messages that creator's given us. And then it becomes real interesting. And, and especially really young people love to talk about their dreams because they're having lots of them. And it's this seventh generation that is really, really gifted that way. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and I, I'm reminded of, I don't know if so much on your emails recently, but uh, when I used to email with you and got to know you way back before graduate school, you, at the end of your emails, you would have dream, dreaming us. Well, yeah, yeah. What, what I mean, I, I'm sure I asked this before, but I can't remember. Uh, what, what does that mean? Or in, in kind of, cause you're just talking about the importance of, of dreams. Uh, so there's a dream dreaming us. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a, a saying from our Kalahari relatives uh, in Africa, who are some of the most original, oldest people on the planet, and and that is their saying that there is always a dream dreaming us, because uh, not just in their reality, but I think in in our, everybody's reality, that's really what's happening is that. Uh, even what we're doing right here, right now, is part of Creator's dream. And it's dreaming us doing this thing that we're doing here. And so there's no separation. See, again, in the uh, Freudian Western worldview, and you ask somebody, well, you, you have a dream. No, uh, it's not that way at all. The way the dream had you. <laughs> See, it's a, it's a real shape shift. And when we say it like that, the, the person is like, well, that's really different. But when we say there's a dream dreaming us right now in, in the process of therapy or whatever, it, it really includes a person into the whole cosmology. Then it becomes what uh, physicists call the quantum entanglement that is always there, but we need to be aware that it's there. 
and then it becomes a real powerful thing in that I'm part of the creator's dream. I mean, that's that's a big deal, you know? And so then you're not just this person or low self-esteem and all that. You're part of the mind of God. And how do you, I mean, we need to really honor that. And so that, you know, makes the person feel good about themselves, but also it's like, wow, I better really learn more about this because I need to raise my knowing and consciousness another notch to be able to understand more. And so it becomes a real creative process for folks to start doing that. Makes sense. And one of the things also, and it's a little bit of a, maybe a detour, but I'm just uh, curious, uh, you know, and so uh, Dr. Duran and one of his colleagues started a, uh, like a reading group uh, uh, that's on Facebook. Uh, it's closed now, but they're doing some, uh, some you know, consciousness raising and, and, and talking about some of these issues. But, you know, I was looking at some of the comments and, and looking at some of the, what was posted. And, you know, one of the things that you talked about was, uh, you know, there's a big sh movement in, throughout the world around like mindfulness and, and Buddhism. And you wrote the, the uh, book, Buddhist uh, in the Red Face. And, and, and one of the things that I, I believe you said was like, like, Buddhism or the Dalai Lamas or, or that train of thinking has very much indigenous roots. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm curious because, you know, in today's world, uh, especially in California and the Bay Area, this right. mindfulness movement and meditation this and meditation that. And so I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts around that and, you know, in the, the how, you know, maybe some indigenous traditions uh, were boot, were were actually the original Buddhist. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, mindfulness and uh, meditation are, uh, again, that and the dream because uh, the original religion, as, especially for all indigenous people, has been uh, uh, going out and fasting, right? And the reason to do that is so you can get the dream, so you can get the vision from, from the mystery. And and especially Tibetan Buddhism, which is what the Dalai Lama practices. I mean, that tradition is really deeply embedded in shamanism because before that it was the Bon religion that the Tibetans practice. And so then when Buddhism came in, they just kind of took the teachings of the Buddha, which are really good stuff. And they just uh, integrated that with the shamanism because the Dalai Lama himself used the shamans when he escaped from China. And, uh, you know, and they came and they went into a trance and they told him exactly which route to take so he wouldn't get caught. And so how did they do that? You know, so they have access to, to this quantum memory or, or something like that. And, and in, you know, in most native traditions, you know, there's the fast. I'm sure your tribe has the fast and had the fast where you go and you just sit quietly, which is a meditative thing, and you meditate until... You get the insight. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, and now there's indigenous uh, meditation groups and mindful groups, which, which is all good. But I think that we need to, uh, again, bring in the native way to, again, uh, restore the soul. Because if we're just practicing Eastern Buddhism, uh, then you know, um, people are not going to like me say, but it could become a colon another way of colonizing us away from who we are. Because, uh, I mean, around 700 AD, the holy man uh, Padmasambhava predicted, and he said that when the uh, iron horse travels across the land and the iron birds fly in the sky, the Buddha will be in the land of the red face. And of course, how did he know that? But what he means by that of course, Buddha means awakening. So what he was predicting is there's going to be an awakening in the land of the red face, which is us here. And he said this 700 AD, this is way before Columbus was even thought of. And he had already had the vision of that. And so I think that <clears throat> what we're doing here right now and in, in, in healing and restoring the soul is kind of a fulfillment of that dream that Padmas and Baba had way back in, in, in the day, where in restoring you know, vision quest and praying and, and those types of things, because 
I mean, in most native ceremony, I remember uh, we were in the ceremony once and uh, and there was a couple of Zen monks in the, in the ceremony. And when we got out, they said, wow, that was like a two week retreat because <laughs> it was so intense, right? Because most native ceremony is really intense. And so it, it kind of can move your consciousness pretty fast. Uh, and, and like these two Zen, they were actual Zen monks and that uh, understood that this is what's going on. And, uh, and then, you know, when I was living in New Mexico, we had one of the premier Buddhist teachers come and do meditation groups with native people. And he was amazed at the way native people could just sit and be still and quiet. He says uh, he'd never seen any, none of them had meditated that way before. But again, it was part of the DNA to be able to just sit still and just be. And, and so I think that is part of, uh, I know it is part of who we are because all the ceremonies from whatever tribe you're from have as the beginning, have that vision that brought the ceremony in the first place. And the only way to have the vision is to sit real still for a long time without food and water, right? And so that'll get you there, so yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So as you talked about, you know, indigenous knowing is very disciplined when it comes to sitting still, uh, mindfulness and, and you know, self-reflection. But I'm curious about how, how does the spirit or the, the spirit of humor or our sacred clowns, how does that play into healing the balance of us as an indigenous people or as people finding that balance? That's exactly it. It's the contrary that brings the balance to the ceremony because again in american buddhism it's so serious and so dreadful you know sitting there all serious and not having any affect well you know and then when the tibetans come and do retreats i mean they're joking and laughing all the time and, and to where people think they're irreverent and in most tribal traditions there there are these people very special people that come in when things are the most serious and they'll do something ridiculous <laughs> bring the balance through the laughter and 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 i've seen it and, and it's so amazing you know like at sundance uh you know two really hard days of praying and suffering and convulsing and all of that and then on the third day here comes these people dressed like mickey mouse or donald duck and they do everything in the opposite direction they do everything wrong and they dance and they spit water and they do all kinds of things and people then start laughing and then it's through that laughter you know again the medicine of joy which the idea of god is was really a joyful thing it's a loving thing it's not this serious god that is just there with no affect i mean that would mean god's depressed or something and so uh yeah, the humor is, is really important. And, and, uh, and I tell, when I used to supervise interns and stuff, I, I would say, you know, if, if that person has sadness and, and you need to make him laugh at least one time that session. And if you can't make him laugh, then uh, you really need to work on that. Because if you can't make him laugh, uh, they're gonna walk out just like they walked in. And so I've been very fortunate that I, I've been blessed with the ability to say some really stupid shit and it makes people laugh. She's so making you laugh. <laughs> and, and it's really important to do that. So I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, and you know, the holy people that I know, the real ones are hardly ever serious. And to where it's aggravating sometimes, it's like, come on, man, can't, can't we? But no, they can't. They just laugh at everything. And uh, because they see the bigger picture and, uh, and so, yeah, the laughter is really, really important. And I know my teacher uh, just laughed at me all the time. And of course, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I thought so I was taking it personal, but he thought I was pretty funny and ridiculous. And, and it's good to have that. And, and even a simple thing, you know, my daughters, you know, when the oldest one was trying to learn how to ride a bike and, and she was very serious about it because she didn't want to make any mistakes and she's out there and, you know, it's really hard. And so I, I just went after her and said, you, you can't learn how to ride that bike unless you act stupid. 
she looked at me like, huh? I says, do you know how to do that? And, and she, she said, well, I guess. I said, well, show me. And she started doing all this stupid stuff. And, and then she started riding the bike. <laughs> you know, as long as she was serious, it, it just couldn't work. Cause you know, she was too intent on being perfect. And, and, and that, that just messes things up. And so, uh, and so that's why, you know, we're working with people also uh, to show some of that humor, but also some of that uh, showing that, uh, you know, that I can be ridiculous also. Because uh, otherwise, if they think this is all serious, we're missing the point. And so I'm glad you brought that up. And, and so uh, uh, sometimes I, I, you know, I would tell therapists when they would try to say something funny and it wasn't, I'd say, you really need to get better writers, man, because uh, your stuff is not funny. <laughs> it's going to make everybody <laughs> laugh if you keep doing that. And so, and then the way you say it, you know, sometimes you can say something really serious and just say it a certain way that makes people laugh. But also in that laughter, I think it opens that spirit door where you can get the attention of the medicine in there. And if you're too serious, it can stay blocked. But when you laugh, it's like you're open, you know, and if you laugh really hard, I mean, uh, yeah, somebody gave me this little book a couple years ago and, and, uh, I don't know who's watching, but it, it, it's got an obscene title to it. It's the uh, F That book. And it's a meditation, but uh, uh, it's, it's, you start reading it and you laugh so hard. I remember this one guy I was seeing and he was very serious. I wanted to read this in here. And after like two or three pages, he was laughing so hard that I was actually worried that he's going to hurt himself because he couldn't stop. <laughs> And, and that's what he needed because he didn't know how to laugh. And, and uh, in this little meditation uh, really helped him open that door of laughter and, uh, and to the point where he, he was almost falling down, he, he couldn't stop laughing. So, so whatever it takes you know, to make, uh, make that humor because you know, native people, wherever I go, uh, humor uh, and joking with each other is really part of that of just the daily activity. And, and hopefully, like in a professional setting, like in your agency, you can really instill that to where it could be part of the job description, you know? If, if you can't laugh, you can't work here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really that important, I think. Because, uh, you know, most, uh, especially psychologists, you know, Western trained psychologists, uh, they just have this way of just being serious all the time and but it's a seriousness with uh with a face that tells you well i really know a lot of stuff and you don't which is total bullshit they don't know anything <laughs> you know and uh, and it's important to uh, to break through that through uh through the humor and mm -hmm. there's you know relevant humor to each tribe right each tribe has ways of of making fun of you of either of another tribe all in a good way and so, and as long as you say in a good way at the end of it, it all goes okay, right? I remember I had a sister-in-law <laughs> sister used to get upset and she said, well, I sure would like to slap him in a good way, of course. <laughs> and so then she thought that would make it all okay, you know? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Well, I really appreciate the question, Teresina. It got me smiling, laughing and it's always good content when we're talking about good sense of humor. Yeah, teresina has got good medicine because she's asked the hardest questions and, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> she's got something going there. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Truly really honored. <clears throat> yeah. So I just want to be mindful of your time, Dr. Dran. We've been approaching the hour mark and um, we have a couple questions from the comment section. So I just want to check in and see how much time you're willing to Give yeah, us. no, ask, go ahead, ask. Okay. So this one's from a fellow colleague of ours at Two Feathers and Mata Lang. Um, she is curious about the challenges or differences that come about when working with psychotherapy services and Native youth. The, the which part? What was the first part of it? What is she? She's curious about the challenges or differences that come about when working with psych psychotherapy services and Native youth there's any challenges about well that. i think we've been kind of talking about that very thing and uh, and it, 
it, it wouldn't be a challenge at all if we just make it native view. And, and like I said, we can always translate. I mean, we can even translate Freud Indian way, you know, and there's big times when I've done that. And, and if we do it Indian way, then it works. If we just stay with Freudian theory, uh, people look at me like, what are you talking about? And, uh, you know, especially in raising children and where, you know, the girl child uh, usually is closer to the dad and the boy child's closer to the mom. Well, if we talk that way, because people know that, but if we say, well, they're having an edible complex, well, that doesn't say anything, right? And so I really encourage uh, people doing the work, day-to-day -day work, is to, is to find out the, especially the images that the native people you're working with, the images that they think in. And then if you can translate the images into English, then you're going places. Uh, but if you just stay with the uh, Western jargon, uh, again, people are gonna probably not come back. And, uh, and I've had people tell me that. They say, you know, the, the way they talk, I just couldn't understand what they were saying. And it's not asking a lot to, to start thinking in images, because if you think in images, then pictures are in movement, you know, towards a story. Uh, versus diagnoses and theory and clinical interventions and all of that, and then it becomes real sterile. And uh, and so hopefully, you know, that can make sense to the person that asked the question. Yeah, and I think a follow up question is like, the psychotherapy has started early as an indigenous youth when trauma is present. Is there a correlation of like less mental health services later on as an adult? Have you? heard of or been a part of any type of example that kind of speaks to that? Well, you mean like uh, in, uh, integrating traditional theory into the therapy? Yeah, just as far as like, you know, like the earlier that they're seeking treatment services, has there been a correlation as far as later on in life? Like, is that effective as far as? Yeah, I mean, uh, actually studies were done way back when I was really studying this stuff. I forget the name. Uh, of the brother, he had a French name, but he basically showed that uh, and there's a direct, uh, almost causality, not just a correlation between uh, reintegrating culture and the incidence of mental health and uh, substance abuse problems. <clears throat> because again, the way I see it is that trauma creates a hole in our soul and we try to replace it with different kinds of spirit, you know, spirit of alcohol, spirit of uh, marijuana. But if we replace it with the right spirit, then it makes sense that if there won't be a need for these other energies to, to entertain us. And so it's really important that as young, even, even pre-birth, as soon as uh, the parents know that they're pregnant, to start talking that way because... Uh, that spirit of that child is hearing everything. And there's actually studies now, the organization uh, Zero to Three, uh, that's in Washington, D.C., they're, they're talking about that, where they find if, uh, you know, like in the inner city, as soon as a, a woman is pregnant, they try to go and <clears throat> talk to her and try to get her to start <clears throat> living in a way that's in accordance to who she is, because that is what's gonna make, because then a child from zero to three uh, they're still not fully cooked, their brain's still developing. And so the first three years are so crucial. And then of course, there are the, there's the ACE study, you know, that talks about trauma early in childhood. So if there's trauma, then of course, life will have problems. But if we integrate spirit back into our lives, the first three years, especially, then a child's probably going to be good to go and, and, and not suffer a whole lot. Yeah, that was really well answered. Um, I think that it's very, the first zero to five years are very formative, you know, like the relationships, the knowledge, and just like the overall environment that they grow up in is going to be very much what they depend on later in life. And so I think you really said that really well. Um, we have another question from a fellow colleague of ours. She's a clinician at Two Feathers, Molly. Um, she asks, what about working in psychotherapy with youth living currently with active trauma? Well, uh, of course, the first thing is safety, right? Uh, you want to 
make sure that the child uh, or youth doesn't get hurt. And, and then, you know, the, the, once they're in a safe environment and depending how bad the trauma is, uh, you gotta go really slow. And especially if the person's really young or any youth, a lot of times the nonverbal therapies are really good to start with because they might not be able to even say what happened because, you know, it gets repressed and it gets kind of shut down by, you know, by mechanisms in the brain and also in our spirit. And in my understanding of working with not just youth, but anyone who's been in trauma is that even though I might know what happened to them, I won't go there until they have a dream that says it's okay to go there. So if they're working with youth that have been traumatized, uh, you probably know what happened, but don't go there until the dream. And even if the person tries to tell, I would, I would say, not yet. We need to wait for the dream to tell us it's okay to go there. And if the dream okays it, then it's not, they don't re-traumatize. And, and it's really important. And again, see, there's a two for one thing because we're telling the person, this dream is really important, dream, dream life, because that's what makes you who you are, is understanding and, and living by the dream. But then the dream will also give you the intervention that tells us now we can talk about what happened and what to do about it. <clears throat> so. Yeah, that's really well said. Man, I could pick your brain all day. Um, so I'm not sure how much time you have, but uh, so yeah, I don't know, Virgil, if you wanted to, you know, ask a question or anything, because there, I don't think there's too many more questions in the comment section. But if you don't mind, you know, we'd love to have just you. Last one, Dr. Duran. Just, uh, uh, I think one of the things that we've kind of touched on, uh, but you know, maybe not so much explicitly, is. Uh, you know, this idea of uh, internalized oppression yeah. uh, and how to, at a community-wide le uh, level maybe, and also maybe at an agency, like, you know, it's something personally in my own life going through Western academia and being at Stanford and the sort of pinnacle of uh, neoliberal sort of white uh, thinking, uh, like how, like what's your, you know, you know, I know you've written some on internalized oppression, but I'm just wondering if, if we could finish off with that as well as like, what do you see as ways? And it's, it's my guess is as much of what you've already talked about, but ways as a community, we can deal with uh, that internalized oppression. Well, I think the, the first step is awareness. In, uh, in a lot of communities, you know, you have like, uh, you know, substance abuse prevention, suicide prevention, and, and those kinds of programs. And there's usually literature that goes with that. And, and, and I, I would really encourage that that literature be written with native metaphor. And also with the idea of tracing this, because yeah, we have responsibility in what we do, but also in knowing that this energy came from somewhere else also liberates us to be able to deal with the problem that we're involved in. And so to just tell somebody, well, you're a perpetrator, you're, you're, you're an abuser, well, they already know that. But to tell them uh, uh, where did this come from, then that becomes an interesting question. And if we have that in the brochures and in literature and in talks that, that we do, then the whole community starts thinking about that to where where did that come from? And like in, in your community, to find the name of uh, the military guy or the gold prospector or whoever was one of the first people that came into the community to genocide that, then you have a name that you can refer back to. And then once you find out who that was, we'll find out what happened to that person. You know, like Andrew Jackson, uh, when I was working at, uh, at Cherokee, Eastern Cherokee, you know, he's the one who started the Trail of Tears. And, uh, but then I asked, well, what happened to him? And so what they found out is that he was Irish. He was of Irish descent. So right away we knew that he had a lot of trauma. He had like a thousand years of trauma in his lineage. So what they did is they actually went all the way to Ireland. Some of the people there went all the way to Ireland and found a place where he comes from. And they found his family lineage and they made offerings 
in forgiveness ceremonies there to also release the spirit of Andrew Jackson. And so, you know, real stuff like that. And then when they came back here, they went back to Oklahoma and they did the Trail of Tears backwards to heal the land where the Trail of Tears happened. You know, and that's pretty big stuff. And it takes a lot of effort to do that. But there's communities that are doing it. And I know there was a long walk somewhere there in, in California. I don't know if it was the Maidu or, or which tribe, but also to find out who the perpetrators were and where they came from and what happened to them. And so then that becomes an interesting historical study. And then instead of saying, well, you're a bad, you know, domestic violence person. Well, now it becomes interesting to the perpetrators like, wow, you know, where did this, where did I learn that? And so now they can become involved in tracing that. And again, working on the situation, you know, safety and also helping them to do impulse control and all of that other good stuff that we know. But without this other piece, uh, it kind of stays trapped. You know, they might stop hitting people, but they're still going to want to, <laughs> see? And it's that energy that gets projected anyway. Even if they don't hit people, it's still that instant of uh, projecting the energy that, that becomes also really destructive. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I think that's, you know, Charlie can take us on home. Uh, I just want to thank you personally, uh, Dr. Duran. You've been a very uh, important figure in my own life, uh, professionally and, and an inspiration and, and a really sort of helped me back when, you know, I was just in graduate school. And, and I appreciate you taking the time of coming on here with uh, some of my colleagues and, uh, you know, your real role model. So thank well, you. Thanks for saying that. And it's good to see you. And uh, I was thinking, man, you, you have an age. You look exactly like you did uh, however long ago I met you. And I'm like, man, his medicine's really good. I need to find out what, you, what you're taking because you look just the same, man. Thank and, you. Uh, it's not I'm fair. trying to keep up with Chris and Teresina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Duran, thank you. Your deep and profound knowledge, um, as well as your positive medicine and energy has truly been impactful for me today. And, you know, your work, you're all a tribal community. So thank you from, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you from as indigenous people. Thank you for your work. Well, thank you for saying that. That means a lot. Thank you. Charlie? Yeah, thank you for me as well. Um, not only as someone who's trying to learn from you as an indigenous person, but someone who says a lot of dumb shit. So I'm glad I could learn from you from that as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, on the dumb shit thing, uh, we were at this ceremony, and there happened to be a rabbi there. And you know how Native people like to tease? So they're teasing this rabbi. So he said something back to the Native brother. So the Native brother says, Rabbi, you know, you're really full of bullshit. And I'll never, I use this a lot now. And the rabbi says, you know what? My bullshit grows corn, though. <laughs> How's it going? So, is that good or what? So, see, parting words, my bullshit grows corn. So, so it's not all bad. I hope uh, that's not offensive to anybody. But <clears throat> I'm happy. The rabbi said it. Hey, a holy man said it. So, I'm just repeating what the holy man said. <laughs> yeah, don't quote me on that. I'm just yeah. You know, quoting. Yeah. But yeah, I also want to thank you, too. I mean, it's an inspiration. It's, I feel like I'm meeting one of my he local heroes here. And so, I really appreciate it from the indigenous perspective as well as from the Western education. I think. You helped me a lot in my assignments, but most of all, like my spirit and my cultural um, integrity. So I really appreciate it. It's an honor. So thank you. Well, thank all of you and keep me in your prayers and, uh, you know, and keep on keeping on, you know, just keep on. And uh, you have uh, Brother Virgil there and he knows all this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, honored to be asked and, uh, and thank you so much for letting me be part of your group. And, uh, yeah, and uh, again, regards to your dad and tell him to to slow down a bit and, you know, uh, ride his bike only around the block. Don't be riding it all the way to Sturgis. I mean, cause that's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes. And the, the viewers out there, thank you for tuning in and being flexible with us today. I also want to take this moment to talk, like kind of introduce a new component of our virtual series is a youth engagement series where we're going to feature some of the youth and families that we serve. 
and it's gonna be really exciting. I know that Chris is gonna be a part of it and many other mentors. I'm excited. There's gonna be things such as cooking and you know fun games to you know keep us occupied during these trying times. And so and I think that's gonna to premiere Tuesday. So be on the lookout for flyers and announcements. Uh, follow, like, and subscribe to this page and till next time. Okay. Well, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Bye.